Okay, plants are not the only alien invader. We've introduced many different types of invasive insects. And if you live in the south, you've heard of this one, the fire ant. Fire ants are throughout the southeast. They have huge economic impact and have altered our natural ecosystems. And if you've ever been stung by one, boy, they hurt. We visited with Dr. Sanford Porter, a well-known fire ant specialist at the USDA lab, and asked him about these small but significant critters. Well, the fire ants came into Florida probably in the, in the 1940s, the late 40s. They were initially introduced into the United States in Mobile, Alabama, and they, they quickly spread out of Mobile uh, in nursery stock and sod, and, and within 10 years they were scattered throughout most of the southeast. When we cut down the trees and make uh, yards, when we uh, plant uh, uh, fields, uh, when we have pastures, all, all of those activities create the perfect habitat for fire ants. Uh, along the edges of roads, in your, in your yard, they, they need open sun. And if they don't get open sun, the colony can't grow. Kind of like plants, it's kind of, kind of strange. But if, it's, if they don't have sun shining on the mound, the mound doesn't get warm enough to be able to produce uh, uh, baby uh, ants. Almost all of the natural enemies were left behind in South America. We find dozens of natural enemies in South America compared to only a couple here. And we think that's why we have five to ten times as many fire ants in the United States as we do in South America. There are four kinds of uh, problems that fire ants cause. The first is a, a, a health problem to stinging people. The second is an agricultural problem to crops and, and animals. The third is, is a mechanical problem to equipment that they, they destroy and jam up, short out. And the fourth is an environmental problem. They, they displace a lot of our native animals. One of the major problems with fire ants is that they uh, every little two-year-old as they um, get running around out in the grass is going to find a fire ant mound and they're going to stand up on top of it. They don't know any better and while they're standing there literally hundreds of thousands of ants are climbing up their leg and they kind of are trying to pitifully brush them off while they're stinging them. One unique way that scientists are looking into controlling ants is by introducing the Ford fly. The South American fly parasitizes fire ants. Sanford has quite a setup to raise forward flies. Okay, what, what we have here is a little shell game. The, the, the uh, trays here will raise every 15 minutes and then, then the next one will, uh, these will fall and then the others will raise. And as that happens, the ants run back and forth between the two, two uh, cups and, and the flies will attack the ants. One right over in here hovering. And as they hover, they kind of, they kind of uh, dive in and inject an egg into the body of the ant. So, what happens after the egg is laid? And the little maggot hatches, and within a couple days, the little maggot worms its way up into the ant's head, and it lives in the ant's head for about two weeks. It's sucking body juices at that point. And at the end of two weeks, what it does is it releases a chemical that causes all the membranes that hold the ant's body together to dissolve. And within a few hours, the head falls off and the body is still left there twitching and the maggot eats everything in the head, the brain, the muscles, the, the glands and everything. Mmm, tasty. Yeah, yeah, and then, it, then it, it pushes its way in and out of the mouth of the ant, pushes away the mandibles and then retracts back into the ant's head and uses the ant's head as a little pupil case or a cocoon. These flies are being released throughout the southeast. Contact your local county extension office to find out if they can be introduced into your area. Boy, one may have to wear these large boots for protection against fire ants, but there are other options. Man, these things are really uncomfortable. We visited with one homeowner, Ray, to see what he does to limit fire ant populations. So Ray, I understand you have a little bit of fire ant problem in your property. Yeah, uh, this is one of the more open lots. I usually keep the front mowed because the kids play football out there and uh, soccer, and uh, but a lot of the back that we don't use that much, I just keep as a natural area. <laughs> the baby loves to come out in the yard. She loves to come outside and just wander around and poke things with a stick. and. Uh, so I really worry about 
them getting into the fire ant nest. Now you're talking like one or two, or is your there's like ten? Or? No, uh, right around this time of year, at any given time, I'll come out into the yard and there'll be seven to eight mounds. Uh, that's on the moat area back uh, in the backyard. We'll probably see about 15, 20 more back there. So when you see these mounds, what's your strategy to get rid of them? I usually uh, use a commercial fire ant bait, uh -huh. try to find something not too toxic because again we have the kids around the house and uh -huh. uh, I just sprinkle the uh, bait around the mound, then check back at the mound probably a day or two later to see if it's uh, completely knocked out the mound or if I need to apply some more. <laughs> Here's one solution. So look for areas in your lawn where you don't have a lot of people in them and just let things come up. And there's no fire ant mounds anywhere to be seen in this area. Well, it is tough to control fire ants, but we learned about some unique methods. See if you can get forward flies released into your area. Let's hear it for the maggots. Because fire ant nests require sun, let plants grow tall enough to shade them out. Use insecticide baits. Be sure to follow instruction and pour only next to the mound. Okay, we have covered a few plants and one notable insect. What about large invasive animals? We visited a growing community, Cape Coral, Florida, where miles of artificial canals have become perfect habitat for a large introduced animal, the Nile Monitor Lizard. We talked with Greg Cloudon, a scientist conducting research on Nile monitor lizards at the University of Tampa. These monitor lizards, by the way, can be bought in almost any pet store. Uh, I've been in the pet trade for uh, some time now, and uh, as you can see, they start out quite small, but they get quite large. They can get up to seven feet in length. They're originally from uh, Africa, the Nile, basically along the Nile, but they're quite widespread throughout Africa very sharp claws so they can climb up trees, very efficiently eat uh, baby birds or eggs uh, out of the nests. Uh, they could also uh, dig up uh, turtle nests, um, eat their eggs, but some of the ones we'd be most concerned about would probably be the burrowing owl, which is a threatened species uh, in Florida, and their largest populations occur in Cape Coral. Researchers at the University of Tampa are catching lizards to see what they eat and how many are out there. This is one of the traps we're using to catch the Nile monitor lizards. This is uh, just a have a heart live animal trap. Uh, um, we actually buy two traps and connect them together. Uh, makes it real strong and it's longer for the, uh, for the lizards, of course. We followed Greg and his assistant around to learn about how they captured lizards. They had set up traps the night before and we are checking them today. Uh, here we are at one of the sites and uh, as you can see here to the left is the waterway and we have banks here and this is where the lizards actually bask and bur make their burrows here and so we're searching for the lizards this is where they typically set their traps but you know as right now we're not having any luck but we're hoping soon after we visit a bunch of traps that we get some of these monitor lizards so you can see these lines here is the line from the the drag of their tail when they drag their tail and you can see that a little bit more clearly going down the bank there hmm we still did not have any success well maybe we can live vicariously we met up with a homeowner that has trapped several nile monitor lizards first one i saw was just after i moved here in october 2002 and it was just on my seawall and it was just like about that size and i didn't know what it was and then the cape magazine came out the thing about them on the move and so then I realized what I got so then I contacted the number on that which was for the city council and I kept seeing them all the time and eventually the guy came out and we started putting some traps out and since then I've caught eight the biggest one was the last one we got in the trap was five foot when I first realized what they were I got really worried because I've heard like horror stories that they will actually come in through you you know the big ones will break through your screen and come after the cats the more I found out about them the more worried I got about them, yeah. you know, but so now we're trapping them, we're actually doing something to try and get rid of them, but this canal here is just full of them. The one thing that we've got also around here are the burrowing owls. If you just go down the second street along there up to the left, 
On either side of it, there's nests. Okay. And that's, I know, what you're worried that the lizards might be going after. This, this is the largest population of burrowing owls, and so to have an animal like a monitor lizard, which, you know, are eating these things like popcorn. The combination of development and a predator may be too much for the owls. Many owls live within a stone's throw of the canals where these lizards live. Because burrowing owls make nests in the ground, their eggs could be eaten by Nile monitor lizards. Ah, back to the traps. We were beginning to lose hope until trap number 18. All right, we got one. Woohoo! Yeah. All right. Oh yeah, look at that guy. Big one. This is Cape Coral's version of Godzilla. Now, and we, we generally like to uh, bring them to be euthanized as quickly as possible so uh, uh, we stop the digestion process so that we can figure out what's in their stomachs. As of March 2005, the researchers have caught over 90 monitor lizards and have determined that they eat insects, lizards and frogs, a few rabbits, and lots of bird and reptile eggs. They have not determined yet whether any of the eggs are owl eggs. Researchers hope to use the information from the study to keep lizard populations at low levels. Well, there you have it. Each one of us can do something to limit the spread of invasive exotics. Let's review some of the more important points. Take time to learn which plants are considered invasive exotics. Do not plant invasives and remove if seen. This website lists invasive plant species of the southeast. Again, invasive exotics are those species that are known to have harmful effects on our native plants and animals. When boating, remember to clean all plants off your boat before moving to another water body. If not, invasive plants will spread into other areas. Use only certified biological controls. Certified biological control agents have been thoroughly tested by the USDA and do not have a negative impact on native species. You can use weevils and psyllids on melaleuca and ford flies on fire ants. Never release any pet into the wild. You may be releasing the next big invasive exotic that could have a huge local impact. For more information about invasive exotics and other living green topics, please visit this website. Thanks for watching Living Green. Till next time.